Hello Spirits, so when you're thinking about a film in development hell, what's the usual response? Well, to me, it's going to be really good or really bad. And it really depends on the teams that make every aspect of said film work. But what about a DreamWorks film? One in development hell since uh, eight years ago? With a title called Puss in Boots, Nine Lies and Forty Thieves. Well, without holding back any punches here, the movie was really good. It now said that it's been nominated for so many things, and that's an incredible achievement, especially when you see the recent movie lineups from the once titans of animation. Because I honestly believe that out of every animation studio, there were only two who are deserving of the crown. Sony, and DreamWorks, where both have really rough histories in terms of their movies, and with both of their last two movies having been fantastic works of animation. But while not both of said movies were perfect, they're changing animation and they're changing their future. But it is still not enough for other studios to even attempt from straying from the same formula, realism and animation. In the past, it's worked for a plethora of studios, and really a lot of studios try to aim for that more realistic looking animation, or some doing something more stylized but still have Having touches of realism, but over time it's just getting tired out. And that's what the first Puss in Boots movie had, a more realistic look in its animation. Same goes for the Shrek universe as a whole, but it all works. It's one of the reasons why Shrek is still a timeless film, but after watching Puss in Boots 1, it still has great characterization, story, but what separated the film from its predecessor was its tone, music, and more focus and development on the multiple fairy tale aspects at a time. And honestly, the film is still really good in my eyes, but while an aspect or two felt rushed or bad, it was still a fantastic film, and I would defend it as its own thing, and so it won't be compared visually wide to the new movie. But it truly has been a long time since I've been hyped for a film. I honestly cannot remember the last time I was this excited for a movie. I remember it as release date and it, that it had positive reviews, and honestly, this film was far better than I'd ever anticipated, and that's why I believe DreamWorks is entering a new era, one where they are competing against someone that isn't Disney, while the remaining studios are dethroned. So without further ado... Puss in Boots follows Puss as he sets out on an adventure to find the Wishing Star, only after losing eight of his lives and being down to his last one. While being in a team with Burrito and Softpaws, they must reach the star while others chase that same destination and one other for another reason. Now, speaking of characters, the characters weren't fantastic, down to the new protagonist to the irredeemable villains, because out of every character revealed, Perito was the character my brother and I believe would be the worst. And at the end of the film, I hated Perito less than I thought I would. Because I actually like him and he, I like an aspect of his character that actually helps the plot. And no, not the star stuff, but with Puss, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But out of every character, I didn't believe the best would be Death. And it's refreshing to know DreamWorks knows how to make amazing and stunning villains still. Considering it's been three years since a good one, or well, I've seen people not consider him a villain, but he hunts down Puss to kill him, even though he has one life left to waste. But anyways, down to his signature chilling whistle, with no music in the background, to what drives him is amazing. And speaking of, I like the motivation that he hates someone having multiple lives, and worse is that Puss never appreciated any life. Unlike those who had just won, he's done actions in the past to help, but most of the time it was to live up to a legend, and cowering when it was too much, and death at the end respecting him for finally showing his worth to his last life was really noble. But speaking of, let's talk about the main character himself. I really like Puss in this film, especially that he wants to solidify his name as a legend. And of course, I have to talk about the scene. Puss in Death Fighting was a fantastic show, because you watch Puss try to hit someone quicker than him, and one that brought a blade to his skin, where blood was actually drawn. And it's not censored with another colour or some object blocking it. No red drink anywhere. Genuine blood on the screen to show the situation Puss was in. And so, he was scared that the immortal may actually die. And it's helped with that you know his past. You can see how good of a fighter he was. He deserves to fear death. He was no longer truly fearless. But what I really love is that scene. The scene that's compared to Velma and doing it better than that. But when he sees death again, 
he runs and starts to have a panic attack. And I really like how they portrayed it in this. It strikes close to me since I have anxiety myself and while it may not appear like it here, I'm in a room with no one watching as I record, and while I've never had a severe or even mild panic attack as others have, and I can't even begin to imagine what they truly feel when they're in that situation, but how they look to others is shown through this film. But all Puss can hear is his heartbeat, so Perito tries to help his friend by calming him down, and Puss pets Perito, and his heartbeat becomes quieter enough to the point there he's actually calm again. He thanks Perito and explains his motives, his cowardliness, but it's amazing that DreamWorks are giving light to those with panic attacks, and one of many ways to properly help them. Now on to soft pause. I honestly really like that they tied apart from the first movie into the next movie. Soft pause had her trust taken away before, and she really just wants one person to trust in her life, and she knew that Puss wasn't the one. She knew him too well that he would settle down in a married life, and Puss knows it hurt her. Right? Not me. Uh-uh. Whenever I've let my guard down, I've been double-crossed, declawed, played, and betrayed. Also, side note, can we appreciate that they continue this after over a decade? I loved the character in the first movie, then she hadn't been seen in over a decade. And instead, Puss had this... thing. But second last, but not last, the last major part of the characters is Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Despite having a family most would kill for, Goldie yearns for a real family, a human family, and doesn't realise the ones who took her in were what she's wanted for years. And I really appreciate it. they didn't have the characters react to her wish badly. They had every right to do so, to have that tropey emotional climax, but no. The mother bear said she'd help in any way they could, and the other two agreed. And that's a change of pace from the usual trope, and they did something like that earlier on as well, when Puss didn't stretch out his talk with soft paws. It felt like he was going to say something else, but no, he actually comes clean to soft paws. But finally, the character that kicked off the entire plot in the first place, Big Jack Horner. Honestly, I didn't know the Plum Nursery was real. I thought it was something made from Adventure Time, but I like how Horner mirrors Perito. He's a character that was given everything and only desires more. While Perito had nothing, had no one, and turned out wanting nothing more than just friends. And I like how not every villain has to be redeemable. Some are just monsters through and through, and yet he's really likeable at times. DreamWorks for years has excelled in the animation department. Even some of their shit movies have amazing animation, but of course the last wish takes the cake. Honestly, as I said, the bad guys was a new step for them, and they really stepped up their game this time, since there isn't a time where the animation isn't fantastic. Like, just about every frame of the animation is stunning, whether a character is moving, or if the lighting is bright, or purposely dense looking or little details if you look closely and so much more. It's really hard to pick a scene and push that I like since there's a lot. Animation wise though, I believe it shines brightest between the puss and death bites. Down to how each moves, what certain actions can represent, to the dynamic posing, perspective shots, to the fluid movements that show the character has his groove back. And there is still so much more to cover, but my favourite is when death is revealed to be well, death. He destroys each of Puss's past lives. It is? And he tells him he's watched each one. And eventually telling Puss that he's straight up deaf. And to the audience as well, but even then, some are still confused on if he actually is deaf. And then, allowing his prey to run and cower once more. The visuals of each passing second help drive the tone of the scene, and I couldn't imagine in any of their past styles. And it doesn't even end there. There's tons of scenes that show DreamWorks' improvement, but I obviously can't edit that much of a video. And the message of the movie was great as well, and thankfully not generational trauma. Disney. As I mentioned, all the characters take something for granted, or want something to feel whole. The general message of the film is self-reflection, and that a wish won't solve what you truly want. Puss wants his lives back, but he never appreciated the past ones. Softpaw wants one person to trust in life, but the one person she wants won't change. Goldie doesn't realise the family she has until they're almost gone, with the only exception being the mirrored characters. One who wants a wish and doesn't learn anything, and the one who doesn't have a wish yet gets what he truly wanted. 
And that's a pretty great message I appreciate from DreamWorks. Some wish for more and don't realize what they truly have until it's gone. Also, it's the same message from the Shrek Forever After movie. Now, the humor is really, really good. Like, from a development hell movie, humor is one of the things you'd expect out the window first. But no, I, I and it's apparent others share the same thoughts. Because I rewatched the movie a second time weeks later and I'm still laughing at a few of their jokes. And a lot of them come from their irredeemable villain Jack Horner. He's a I am gonna bust you up, Plum Fum, and then I'm gonna wear your clothes! That was weird. Seriously, almost every line this guy says is basically gold. Horrible! Your wish is horrible! You're horrible! You're an irredeemable monster! Oh, oh, what took you so long, idiot? It doesn't help that he's voiced by the guy who did Spider-Man. Like, the movie doesn't pander to relying on just one age demographic. Like, they didn't go for toilet humor or any of the kiddish bullshit. They wrote good quotes and jokes, some to name with shock humor done right. Pig, rat face, butt nugget, for brain. Unlike the animated adult shows nowadays. Or even some jokes that are funny with the build-up. Is that a stick? What are you gonna do with that? Ow! Ow, You shouldn't have done that, mate. Yeah. So I'm glad this movie still keeps its humor intact, because I really can't think of any bad jokes that were present. Also, what I gotta say, the music really slaps here, and I don't mean just Death's Whistle or Puss's Hero Song, which, by the way, I thought was going to be really, really cringy, but it's got a great beat, catchy lyrics, and those on TikTok seem to love it. Also, it's stuck in my head. But it's also the background tunes that are amazing as well, that drive the scenes, such as Death's Whistle, followed by nothing in the background. But one of my favorite is Getaway. It has such a catchy tune and here I'll show a little clip from it. Finally, you need therapy. And yeah, that really ends my thoughts. I have seen so many people say this movie was fantastic and a great comeback to DreamWorks and I couldn't help but agree. I honestly think this movie is a 10 out of 10 if I'm honest. Despite being in development hell for years, the movie made a comeback that most don't even get. DreamWorks of all people are stepping up their game with animation, bringing back amazing antagonists, touching upon subjects that other pieces of media spit on, incorporating great humor and fun characters that can be used as reaction media. But I truly believe this is DreamWorks' era their time to shine. Because when I look back at DreamWorks' history, they have movies that have mixed views, and I believe the 2013 through 2021 era was some of DreamWorks' worst work yet. Obviously, not every movie they made from that era was bad, but some were either underrated or mediocre, and a lot of the time, some were really bad or forgettable. And even then, of course, they've had a few eh movies prior, but some of those recent films were charming, amazing, and their best. Because I don't know about you, but I don't hear anyone discussing Abominable or Turbo, much less do I see a frame or quote being used from their films. Unlike something like, Finally, a worthy opponent. Our battle will be legendary. Or, There is no Easter Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and there is no Queen of England. So I want to believe that this new growing animation style, DreamWorks will rise to the top and begin their new era of animation, where Disney the once king of animation is toppled for sticking to realism, and making choices in their movies that bring down the entire film as a whole. Though I may be wrong, only time will tell if DreamWorks will stick to this formula, making good movies, and not go back to those mediocre films.